Hi everybody, this is my audiobook reading of the collected works of Podrick H. Pierce, Political Writings and Speeches. I'll be recording and releasing it one chapter at a time, and then when the whole volume is complete, I'll put it together and put it on YouTube. Collected Works of Podrick H. Pierce, Political Writings and Speeches Chapter 7, O'Donovan Rosser, Character Sketch O'Donovan Rosser was not the greatest man of the Fenian generation, but he was the most typical man. He was the man that to the masses of his countrymen, then and since, stood most starkly and plainly for the Fenian idea. More lovable and understandable than the cold and enigmatic Stevens, better known than the shy and sensitive Kickham, more human than the scholarly and chivalrous O'Leary, more picturesque than the able and urbane Luby, older and more prominent than the man who, when the time comes to write his biography, will be recognised as the greatest of the Fenians, John Devoy. Rosser held a unique place in the hearts of Irish men and Irish women. They made songs about him. His very name passed into a proverb. To avow oneself a friend of O'Donovan Rosser meant in the days of our fathers to avow oneself a friend of Ireland. It meant more. It meant to avow oneself a mere Irishman, an Irish enemy, an Irish savage, if you will, naked and unashamed. Rosser was not only extreme, but he represented the left wing of the extremists. Not only would he have Ireland free, but he would have Ireland Gaelic. And here we have the secret of Rosser's magic, of Rosser's power. He came out of the Gaelic tradition. He was of the Gael. He thought in a Gaelic way. He spoke in Gaelic accents. He was a spiritual and intellectual descendant of Col McKill and of Sean on Deermish. With Col McKill, he might have said, If I die, it shall be from the love I bear the Gael. With Shane O'Neill, he held it debasing to twist his mouth with English. To him, the Gael and the Gaelic ways were splendid and holy, worthy of all homage and all service. For the English, he had a hatred that was tinctured with contempt. He looked upon them as an inferior race, morally and intellectually. He despised their civilization. He mocked at their institutions and made them look ridiculous. And this again explains why the English hated him above all the Fenians. They hated him as they hated Shane O'Neill and as they hated Parnell, but more. For the same crime against English law as his associates, he was sentenced to a more terrible penalty, and they pursued him into his prison and tried to break his spirit by mean and petty cruelty. He stood up to them and fought them. He made their whole penal system odious and despicable in the eyes of Europe and America. So the English found Rosser in prison a more terrible foe than Rosser at large, and they were glad at last when they had to let him go. Without any literary pretensions, his story of his prison life remains one of the sombre epics of the earthly inferno. O'Donovan Rosser was not intellectually broad, but he had a great intellectual intensity. His mind was like a hot flame. It seared and burned what was base and mean. It bored its way through falsehoods and conventions. It shot upwards, unerringly, to truth and principle. And this man had one of the toughest and most stubborn souls that have ever been. No man, no government, could either break him or bend him. Literally, he was incapable of compromise. He could not even parley with compromises. Nay, he could not act, even for the furtherance of objects held in common, with those who did not hold and avow all his objects. It was characteristic of him that he refused to associate himself with the new departure, by which John Devoy threw the support of the Fenians into the land struggle behind Parnell and Davitt. Even though the Fenians compromised nothing, and even though their support was to mean, and did mean, the winning of the land war, Parnell and Davitt he distrusted, home rulers he always regarded as either foolish or dishonest. He knew only one way, and suspected all those who thought there might be two. And while Russell was thus unbending, unbending to the point of impracticability, there was no acerbity in his nature. He was full of a kindly Gaelic glee. The olden life of Munster, in which the Shan Hui told tales in the firelight and songs were made at the autumn harvest and at the winter spinning, was very dear to him. He saw that life crushed out, or nearly crushed out, in squalor and famine during 47 and 48, but it always lived in his heart. In English prisons and American cities, he remembered the humour and the law of Carberry. He jested when he was before his judges. He jested when he was tortured by his jailers. Sometimes he startled the silence of the prison corridors by laughing aloud and by singing Irish songs in his cell. They thought he was going mad, but he was only trying to keep himself sane. I have heard from John Devoy the story of his first meeting with Rosser in prison. Rosser was being marched into the governor's office as Devoy was being marched out. In the gaunt man that passed him, Devoy did not recognise at first the splendid Rosser he had known. Rosser stopped and said, John... Who are you? said Devoy. I don't know you. I'm Rosser. Then the waters came between them. Devoy has described another meeting with Rosser, and this time it was Rosser who did not know Devoy. One of the last issues of the Gaelic American that the British government allowed to enter Ireland contained Devoy's account of a recent visit to Rosser in hospital in Staten Island. 
it took a little time to make him realise who it was who stood beside his bed. Are you John Devoy? he said at last. During his long illness, he constantly imagined that he was still in an English prison, and there was difficulty in preventing him from trying to make his escape through the window. I have not yet seen any account of his last hours. The cabling of any such things would imperil the defence of the realm. Enough to know that that valiant soldier of Ireland is dead, that that unconquered spirit is free. Chapter 8. O'Donovan Rosser. Graveside Oration. This is a short narrator's interjection. I would just like to thank the anonymous reader who contributed a reading in Irish for this chapter. She'd prefer to remain unnamed, but her work is very much appreciated. End narrator's interjection. O'Donovan Rosser. Graveside Panegyric. Agela, the hira Irma Salawert in Jew er son of Will Crinehe er on law her so, August er son of Will Bio de Clon of Gael, Egmola on Loan Galagmar, e Grey on Shaw, August Egrias a Manmon, Nagarad a Tog of Bronach in a Yig. A Corja, Nobig Bron er Enya, a Ta in a Chassiv, Egon Uig Shaw. Oct big Buikis a Gwyn in our Greehev de Yea Nagros, Go Crohig Anam Usel Olin. Dirmida we Donovan Rossa agus hus re ada yo er on sale sho. Bakalma on far hu a yermid. Is trained the eris ka er son kirt de kina. Is ni biog er hulingus. Agus ni yen fa gael dermidur to gabron a breha. Ak to korja, na biog bron urin. Ak biog mishnok in our grihiv agus biog nyart in our guishlanov. Or tigimish nak me an ain vos aun nak me an asherga in a yig. Agus garabas an uig sha agus as na huganav ata in ar dimshgil erakas sir shagil. And now the same in English. I was asked to speak today on behalf of everyone gathered in this place and on behalf of all living gales, to praise the lion that we have buried here and to give courage to the friends who mourn him. Friends, let no one standing at this grave be sad. Rather let our hearts be thankful to the grace of Jesus, who created Jeremiah O'Donovan Ross's noble, beautiful spirit, and who blessed him with a long life. You were a splendid and brave man, Jeremiah. Fiercely you waged war for the rights of your race, and no small amount did you suffer. You will never be forgotten. But friends, let us not be sad. Let us have courage in our hearts and strength in our arms, for let us understand that after all death comes resurrection, and that from this grave and the graves surrounding us will rise the freedom of Ireland. End English translation. It has seemed right, before we turn away from this place in which we have laid the mortal remains of O'Donovan Rosser, that one among us should, in the name of all, speak the praise of that valiant man, and endeavour to formulate the thought and the hope that are in us as we stand around his grave. And if there is anything that makes it fitting that I, rather than some other, I rather than one of the grey-haired men who were young with him and shared in his labour and in his suffering, should speak here, it is perhaps that I may be taken as speaking on behalf of a new generation that has been rebaptized in the Fenian faith and that has accepted the responsibility of carrying out the Fenian program. I propose to you then that here, by the grave of this unrepentant Fenian, we renew our baptismal vows, that here, by the grave of this unconquered and unconquerable man, we ask of God, each one for himself, such unshakable purpose, such high and gallant courage, such unbreakable strength of soul as belonged to O'Donovan Rosser. Deliberately here we avow ourselves, as he avowed himself in the dock, Irishmen of one allegiance only. We of the Irish volunteers, and you others who are associated with us in today's task and duty, are bound together and must stand together henceforth in brotherly union for the achievement of the freedom of Ireland. And we know only one definition. It is Tone's definition. It is Mitchell's definition. It is Ross's definition. Let no man blaspheme the cause that the dead generations of Ireland served by giving it any other name and definition than their name and their definition. We stand at Ross's grave not in sadness, but rather in exaltation of spirit, that it has been given to us to come thus into so close a communion with that brave and splendid Gale. Splendid and holy causes are served by men who are themselves splendid and holy. O'Donovan Rosser was splendid in the proud manhood of him, splendid in the heroic grace of him, splendid in the Gaelic strength and clarity and truth of him, and all that splendour and pride and strength was compatible with a humility and a simplicity of devotion to Ireland, to all that was olden and beautiful and Gaelic in Ireland, all the holiness and simplicity of a patriotism, of a Michael O'Clary or an Owen O'Growney. The clear, true eyes of this man, almost alone in his day, visioned Ireland as we of today would surely have her, not free merely, but Gaelic as well, not Gaelic merely, but free as well. 
In a closer spiritual communion with him now than ever before, or perhaps ever again, in a spiritual communion with those of his day, living and dead, who suffered with him in English prisons, in communion of spirit too with our own dear comrades who suffer in English prisons today, and speaking on their behalf as well as on our own, we pledge to Ireland our love, and we pledge to English rule in Ireland our hate. This is a place of peace, sacred to the dead, where men should speak with all charity and with all restraint. But I hold it a Christian thing, as O'Donovan Rosser held it, to hate evil, to hate untruth, to hate oppression, and, hating them, to strive to overthrow them. Our foes are strong and wise and wary, but strong and wise and wary as they are, they cannot undo the miracles of God, who ripens in the hearts of young men the seeds sown by the young men of a former generation. The seeds sown by the young men of 65 and 67 are coming into their miraculous ripening today. Rulers and defenders of realms had need to be wary if they would guard against such processes. Life springs from death, and from the graves of patriot men and women spring living nations. The defenders of this realm have worked well, in secret and in the open. They think that they have pacified Ireland. They think that they have purchased half of us and intimidated the other half. They think that they have foreseen everything, think that they have provided against everything, but the fools, the fools, the fools, they have left us Alphenian dead, and while Ireland holds these graves, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace.